Hi boys and girls, I'm in the lair and off to the side of the camera that you can't see. Berwin is, uh, well he, he's nigh catting on the side underneath the uh, tripod right now so you can't see him. So today I figured we'd have a little more uh, uh, transoceanic fun. Um, I, I expect to get better results than we did with the uh, 1L4s, but uh, we're going to do something a little bit different today. Um, before I even get started, you know, maybe I should just tell the folks to that are not Xena Transoceanic uh, people or don't even know what the radio is. Uh, maybe I should just give you a little, little uh, history as to uh, uh, the radio itself and what we're going to do today. Um, basically, the, 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 the Xena Transoceanic was uh, basically part of the idea of Commander Eugene McDonald, um, who was the, the founder of the Zenith uh, Radio Corporation uh, later on, uh, uh, became TVs and uh, uh, computers and other things, but uh, I think he lived up until about 1958 or so. Um, Commander McDonald was actually, uh, you know, he was pretty much into technology. He was, uh, um, he, he, he liked uh, new ideas and uh, the, the Zenith uh, Radio Corporation did really, really well uh, in the early stages in the 20s and, uh, you know, then once they got into the Depression, it kind of staggered a little bit. Um, I, I know that uh, Atwater Ken I think made it till about 36, and RCA was kind of, you know, they they weren't really full bore in the radio, although that was a big chunk of their uh, uh, of of the, the the money they were bringing into the company. Um, but but Zia somehow has always done well, and now now you're coming up to uh, the 40s. Now Commander McDonald was a really big yachtsman. Uh, he loved he loved uh, sailing on the water. I know he spent time in the Navy, thus getting the name uh, Commander McDonald. Uh, not really sure what he was the commander of, but uh, he, he was a full blown Navy guy and loved the water. So he put it to the. And we're still in the late thirties, and I guess I don't know exactly when, but he put it to his uh, his engineering staff that he wanted to have a, a portable tube radio that could, could pick up shortwave, could be battery operated, so he could take it with him and uh, be portable out on his boat when he went sailing. So, uh, and, and he gave him a time frame. You only've got to whatever that time frame was until 1940 to come up with an idea, and then thus the birth of the Transoceanic. Now, um, before we get started, uh, uh, let, me, let me show you uh, certain things about the radio and what we're going to do today. Okay, there's Nappy Cat. <laughs> we won't bother him. Now, first of all, I want to show you this 1A7 tube here. Now, this 1A7 tube uh, basically was a, was the converter tube that went into some portable radios, battery portable radios, and maybe uh, battery AC radios at the time. And see, it did use this tube in, in a number of their radios, particularly the uh, 5G401, uh, which was a five-tube uh, set. It, it did the job. It was good for receiving AM uh, reception, but it wasn't quite up to snuff. So what the Zenith had to do was, since the commander wanted short wave, this guy came around. This is a 1LA6. And the 1LA6 not only went into the early transoceanic radios, but also went into uh, some of the AM battery portables as well. And this provided enough oscillation to get you up into, uh, say, 16 megacycles or, or so, and uh, be able to receive some shortwave broadcasts. But this was a Lochtal tube, and, and basically as time went on, you know, the funny thing is, is that um, there, there were approximately, uh, before uh, World War II uh, started, uh, Zenith started making production using this tube. But then there were other things going on with, uh, uh, you know, getting the, the war effort going. So there, Zenith even made about a thousand or so of the early transoceanics to give to uh, people uh, for, uh, you know, if they were, if they had some status or wealth or whatever. So, thus, once they got back from the war, they started making some more uh, 7G and 8G radios, and then all of a sudden, you got into the miniature age, and then the 1L6. 
this is a miniature tube that could get you uh, into the 18 mega cycle range which is a slightly better than the one LA6 um, what I have here is a brand new old stock it says Janwell at 1L6 which means basically joint army and navy and uh, these were built uh, to a little bit higher degree than the production 1L6's um, they were basically meant to take a little bit more abuse they could take some shock and uh, they were ruggedized so basically what we're going to do is we're going to play around with the 1L6 but I have uh, here off to the side of the camera something even better or supposedly better and we're going to kind of see what we can do with this let me get this out of the way and this is the solid state version of the 1L6 which from what I've read on the web and what I've heard about supposedly is even better than the regular 1L6 tube as far as being able to pick things up and, and uh, reception on the, on the higher bands, actually through all the bands. Now, I know that some of you might laugh at this, what I'm about to say. I've kind of always wanted one of these to experiment with, and what's held me back from getting one is that they're, they're kind of stupid expensive. When I say that, you can shop around and maybe find a 1L6 for 20, 25 bucks now. The solid state versions were always around 45, 50 bucks. I think they were even more for a while. I paid $50 for this tube out of my pocket. But we're going to play with it and we're going to see if that is better than that. So we're, we're, we're going to put them to the test. Okay, boys and girls, here's how we're going to actually do this here. I've got a number of things sitting here. Now this is a, um, I didn't feel like taking one of my good chassis out. I, my, uh, I, I have two really nice Transocean Yanks and I didn't want to pull the chassis out. So what I have here is a 6A40 from either an A or B600 Transoceanic. It's actually a working chassis. It's got a mild hum. Um, the sleeve rectifier is a little low on voltage. Uh, chassis is solidly all original including the stupid bumblebee caps and uh, it's got a broken dial pointer string here but I've got the bread slicer pretty much all the way open I cleaned the band switch so that we could at least get stuff on the upper uh, band here which is the 16 uh, meter band I am probably in the neighborhood of 18 megacycles or so this is an unrestored radio by the way um, so it's probably off a little bit, but this will serve the purpose of what we're, we're trying to show uh, uh, tube-wise here. And I've got my ICO signal generator, my 324, which I love. I know that uh, old 64 GOAT has one of these things. It's a nice little generator, and I have nothing connected there. I'm just using the air to basically transmit a signal to the radio. To measure the signal, I've got my Fluke 75 here and I have it set on the AC volt meter range. And all I've done was just taken a meter and connected it up to the speaker. So I, then as the audio uh, output increases, uh, thus we'll, we'll see a difference in the voltage. It's not going to be a lot. It's just going to be a little bit. But it'll be, like again, it'll be enough for us to uh, do what we need to do. Now I did prior with not the camera not running, I did tune around the 16 meter band and uh, it's now after one o'clock in the afternoon this is the radio wild timepiece here fine piece of equipment right there at a clock 20 after one or so in the afternoon and uh, usually signals up in that range um, you're good to about 10 30 11 o'clock in the morning maybe later on if you got a local signal um, I was able to pick up a couple stations on the 19 meter band just the way it is so I figured since signals are going to drop in and out, I'd use the generator, and the generator will leave me a, a solid signal and a constant. Now I've had the generator on for about 25 minutes, so everything should be nice and heated up. This guy's been on for the same amount of time. So let me connect a wire antenna here, and let's see what the meter says. Now right now, 
Here we get a get my pointer here. We're looking into the chassis. This guy right here is the 1L6. Okay. So that's the 1L6 tube tube. That's in the radio. And uh Okay, let me put the antenna on and see what we got. Ooh, a little bit. There we go. Okay, I'll leave it right there. Okay, gang, I have now swapped the tube. That is the $50 solid state 1L6. Okay, I've got the meter still hooked up at the same frequency. Let me put the antenna on and see what the difference is. Now, with the conventional 1L6, we got 0.15 volts before, point, yeah, 0.15 volts AC. Let's see what we get with this. I have not touched anything. with the solid state 106 and look at the difference it's huge at 18.1 18.2 megacycles look at that it's almost double so I have to say that that solid state tube is a winner better than the other two. At least. I can't do conventional math. Maybe you can. So from 0.15 volts to 0.26 volts. And all I did was just change that too. So I'd say that's a winner. Is it worth the $50? Well, that's up to you. Why don't you comment and let me know. Hey, and thanks for tuning in. Take care.